Welcome back to the Sports Booth Podcast. You are hello, joined hello. by myself and Husey once again. Hello from yep. myself. Hello from you, Husey. How are you going? G'day, g'day. I'm doing pretty well. Um, so what episode are we up to now? 32 or something? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 26. <laughs> that that can't be right. If it was episode 26, we'd still be in June. We're in August uh, now. I knew that it was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. Husey's, so, Husey's proud of himself because his so, dragon's got to win. So, <laughs> wait. So, wait. What... What... what? What month did you say it wouldn't be? It would be when the dragons won again. I actually meant it was just from remind after the good game. listeners from after this game. It was till August. Oh still, no! I think yeah, was, yeah. Uh, this was the one anomaly. Uh, they're not wanting to no. August now. Just watch. No, um, no, no. no yes. okay. We'll get, sorry, we'll sorry, get sorry, on just... to. <laughs> we'll get on to the rugby. So later. it is episode twenty six. We made it to twenty six, <laughs> which is I think is pretty good. Um, a lot to talk about on today's show. Um, Yes. Oh, yeah, you're speechless. Well, I, I, love uh, this. I am. I am because speechless. it was it was it was painful. It was a weird scenario, and we'll get to it in rugby league. And I'll tell, I'll break down the, the full scenario from kind of start to finish. Yep. On my point of view of what happened, and and the disbelief I was in, and still kind yep. of am in, and how rocked I was from for the rest of the weekend due to the dragons actually getting the win and my surprise. Um, but yeah, mm. so there's there's obviously the dragons to talk about, but the whole of the NRL. Uh, origin yes, squads were named as well, so that's mm. uh, that's going to be a hot talking point, uh, especially with the New South Wales side, as you are a New South Welshman and I'm a New Zealander who goes for Queensland. Yep. Uh, <laughs> just to point that out, you can um, never be an underdog, can you? You just love well, being you love brother, being on top, brother. Excuse me, I support the Gold Coast <laughs> Titans, who are currently 16th in the NRL. Oh. <laughs> that, no, that's that's not even being an underdog. That's like being a cat on a greyhound <laughs> race. Like, <laughs> Yes, so I don't want to hear that from you. Um, but yes, so Super Rugby final <laughs> as well, uh, and a couple of uh, points from Super Rugby. Obviously, Australians mm. hit the headlines. The CEO um, with some interesting points, which we will discuss, and then a bit of international rugby as well uh, with England playing yes. the Barbarians and the English coming over here, and a lot to discuss and make of that game as well. Mm. But let's get straight into it. The final of Super Rugby Pacific, Crusaders win 21-7. to Both men, you picked it. Uh, I don't want to say that we know our rugby, but we know our rugby union, Husey, don't we? Yeah, we do. We I don't think either of us, though, and I don't think many people saw the scoreline being um, as wide as it was. I mean, 21-7, to the final result to the men from Christchurch. And uh, look, it never felt like the game was out of their hands. Richie Moonga showed up, and I think it's safe to say that he was player of the game by a fair a fair stretch. Like he was everywhere, creating everything for the Crusaders. And uh, the Blues' only points came off a uh, exceptional play from Finley Christie, I believe, um, stealing one out the back of a scrum and, and launching himself over line in heroic effort. But uh, yeah, there was no answers from the Blues for what the Crusaders were bringing, and so. Um, they they put up a they put up a stat today, which I think sickens every other Super Rugby fan to their core, which is that uh, the Crusaders have won 13 Super Rugby titles, and the next closest is the Blues at four, and that is just a tough pill to swallow. That was scary. It's scary because what we I think it started 95 was the first title. Yeah. So 95. So we're what. Not even 20 years into this. So it's 20... 20, 20. No, we are. Sorry, yep. sorry. We're, nearly, we're nearly 30 years into it. We're, yeah. we're 27 years. So they've won about half of them. They've won, won just under half. I think it's just under half, and I think it's by like two games, or two two titles. Yeah. So it's like, it's a madness when you think about that, that how successful they are. Yeah. It's, it's just incredible. And I mean, like you said, I think it was a dominant performance from every, every crusader mm. on that pitch. Like I, I obviously do my teams of the week, and I think it was two players... From the Blues made the the starting side, and that was Hoskins Tutu and Dalton Papalia, who I think ah, that was that, it's a tough thing now to look back in hindsight. And I know obviously getting your appendix move isn't a, a small operation, but if he was going to be named, why didn't they start him and he play eighty? I know he wasn't match fit, but the difference he definitely makes on the field it was just unreal. Like yeah. looking at his stats, you know he he ran for more meters than than both of the other sevens combined. Uh, he made. Four less tackles than Tom Christie in the game, and he had as many turnovers as Tom Christie. And I know Tom Christie had one of the bigger turnovers of the game at the end there. But just for me, when he's on the on the field, you know that 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 I said it in the uh, in the review. 
that step to break the line for from just for him as well, where he broke inside, you know, Funga Nuku and Cody Taylor. That's two All Blacks now, and Funga yeah. Nuku probably had his one of his better games of the season. And I was like, man, that's just a he's he's at another level. He's one of those players that you know, like. Uh, again, a, a very Cam Munster, I think, kind of like player. He makes mm. everyone else look like they're literally playing part footy. Like, that's Cody Taylor and Whanganui Nuku. Those are two <laughs> All Blacks, and he's just neat, broken through them yep. without them even getting a touch. Like, there was no one outside him. There was no one inside him. Like, it was literally just him putting a step on Whanganui Nuku and then Cody Taylor not being quick enough. And I was like, just to me, that was a little interesting part. I didn't mention it in the review, was that he didn't play 80. And I, I go back, I think if they had their time over, they'd probably just say, look, if you want to get through it, let's, let's start you and see how we go because they were never able to come back into the game um, and I just think he's such an important piece of them. But I also like what you said. Monga, I think for me, had his be- biggest game and his that was his biggest game in uh, a Crusaders jumper because we've all always kind of said it and I know there'll be those doubters who'll say, oh, he was behind that great four pack, but he yeah. delivered so many times on that, on that behind that four pack and this time he really... I think his play stepped up another level. Like his run game was was on show, and he just looked like it was it was another beast com- completely. And I think Bryn Haller, another one I mentioned in the video. I think him at nine is is highly underrated. Um, and I think he had a fantastic game as well. But I I do just want to mention now, we've talked about all of this Crusaders. Is is this the best franchise in sport? Like I know there's a lot to go around. You got like the New England Patriots. You you had you know the Boston Celtics in their moments over there. You, you come here and you see like the Melbourne Victory or Sydney FC. Uh, I know the Breakers in the NBL mm. have had some moments. You go overseas, you know, you've got, I know the London Wasps, Leicester Tigers, all of those. But I go Barcelona, if we want to get into football, Real Madrid, you know, they've had top moments. And But there's no one who's really dominated. Melbourne Storm come to mind, but not even the success that the Melbourne Storm have had kind of rivals what the Crusaders have had. And you can say, oh, there's been this and that with the Super Rugby changing, so many different teams. But this is now, like a, like you said, you know, just about 30 years of complete and utter domination throughout the comp. Like, I don't know when's the last year they either missed the playoffs or just weren't a chance to at least win it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, they're definitely up there with some of them. Yeah, I think because they've, it's going to sound strange, they've only got 30 years of history Right, that sort of sets them back a bit against some of these more long-term franchises. Like I look at probably the LA Lakers yep. as probably the most successful franchise of all time because I think every single decade they've uh, they've come close to winning a championship or they have won a championship, yep. something like that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm just looking at here on Wikipedia. So the 40s, the 50s, not in the 60s, in the 70s, the 80s. Um, not the nineties, but the two thousand and two thousand ten and two thousand twenty, they've won a they've won a championship. So that's pretty good. So from nineteen forty nine, so and they were established in nineteen forty seven. Um, so that's pretty pretty consistent. Um, I think. And for me, that the fact that it's over a longer period of time is that's probably what um gives the Lakers probably a little bit of a edge for me yep. over say. The Crusaders, because it's it's been within thirty years, and as well as that, uh, the Crusaders have got, I guess, a shallower competition pool than, um, say, then that's then the Lakers or or other, I guess, like bigger sport leagues. You know, yeah. you look at, uh, you know, the, the NRL, and that's um, a, a bigger competition. Oh, well, not that much bigger, actually. In fact, um, but uh, not uh, not guess, compared yeah, to what like, used yeah, to be things like that. You mean, yeah, like. Like, you know, we had Super Rugby, we got to 18 teams, but the competitiveness yeah. of those 18 teams weren't quite the same as, as what you kind of see from, from yeah. the NRL. Yeah, and, you know, NFL's 32 teams, things like that. So, yeah, I think they're definitely in the conversation, for sure. I guess it's just hard to compete with the history of some of these clubs. You know, even, like, uh, Liverpool in the in the EPL, they had a long, they've had a long history of always being successful. You know, even Manchester United has a history of being successful, but relatively recent compared to how old the EPL is and things like that. Yeah. So um, I think the Crusaders definitely up there and they're established themselves. And the more years that go by and the more championships yeah, they, they win, win. Yeah. the more that they, they cement <laughs> that. So I think it's, I, I think, uh, yeah, they're, they're well on their way to doing that. And I guess, yeah, like, like, like you said, in another 20 years time, if they've added another 10 championships, you're probably going, okay, now we've yeah. got to have this discussion. But saying that, will we have a Super <laughs> Rugby in even two years time? 
uh, is yeah. the question. So I'm gonna I want to get your first take on it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run down for the people who haven't heard. The uh, CEO of Australia Rugby pretty much said, you know, everything's off the table from after next year. So next year, Super Rugby Pacific guaranteed for another year. From uh, is it? So that gives us 2023. Then 2024, it's mm. all. There's no contracts, uh, no agreement between Australian Rugby and New Zealand Rugby for any competition. It's it's going to be an open book and and kind of see what they want to do. Take everything into the best perspective. And they've kind of said they will leave if they have to, if they think it's best for the game, if they want to compete against NRL, AFL, they'll do it. They've got the backing of the Super Rugby teams. Super Rugby teams, the head officers, let's say, of them, have said, yeah, they're happy yeah. to, to, to follow Rugby Australia's path and, and what they think is best. I want your thought on it now. I spoke briefly of it in the review, but your thought, Husey. Yeah. I think it's a bit of sabre rattling and a bit of just chess beating and, like, you've got to take us as seriously as you, you take um, yourselves to, to Rugby New Zealand, I guess, and they want a bit... Um, they want a bit more of a slice of the pie, I guess. Uh, so I, I, I think that um, they want to stay in. I think the success of the teams this year shows that they can compete and stay in. Um, compete if they stay in. Um, yeah, I think that uh, if they if they don't stay in and it splits, they need to do sort of what you were talking about last week. You're almost a bit prophetic last <laughs> week in your in your discussion of what super rugby needs to do we could see that competition pop up but there's just it, and it's completely separate from super rugby um pacific or maybe it's renamed super, uh, super rugby aotera i probably butchered the pronunciation there but you know <laughs> super rugby nz let's call it yeah. for my for my for sake Aussie, for you uh, the <laughs> yeah hey that's you how often do i need you to tried. say that yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> i put an effort an effort was made <laughs> um but yeah, you, you need to expand the competition for sure beyond five teams. It needs to be at least eight, I yeah. think. I think eight, it, you can have a competition. Um, and I think that is uh, like a good amount. If I'm looking at, let's look at, say, uh, you know, England, uh, right? So they've got, in the NRL, they've got, or oh, the Rugby League, they've got a 12-team Super League, right? Um, how many teams are in the... Multiple divisions, uh, though. D- uh, yeah, there Sunday. is there is that, but there, there's they, but at least you look if we're building something for Super Rugby in Australia yep. or whatever it might be called in Australia. Yep. Let's look at that. So there's there's twelve teams that. So then the English um, domestic rugby competition, whatever that's called. Let's see, I don't even know the name of it. That's what my I first concern in there is. Twelve. I think it's Premiership Rugby. Yeah, twelve. Or Premiership Rugby. There's thirteen. There's thirteen. Thirteen. Now yeah. there's thirteen teams. Right. So. 12 to 13 teams. That's sort of where you need to get to, to have a, have a competition, but you start at eight, yeah. right? And I think you actually, you need to, it's going to, it'd be a dramatic overhaul. And if that's the level that they're thinking of, then that's very ambitious and it, and it could work. You need to build a competition that rivals the NRL. So you need to also transform your franchises then. So you won't have the Waratahs anymore. You'd have the, the Sydney Waratahs, the New South Wales Waratahs. You'd have the Sydney Waratahs. You'd have the Newcastle something. You'd have um, ACT Brumbies could stay ACT Brumbies. But, and Melbourne Rebels could stay Melbourne Rebels. Queensland Reds would become the Brisbane Reds or something like that. Uh, and you, then you develop further teams within those areas. So like you might have the, the Sydney uh, Waratahs, the Illawarra something or others, the Newcastle something or others. In Queensland, you have the Brisbane somethings, you have the Gold Coast somethings. In uh, you know ACT, you've got Melbourne um, and you've got Perth, uh, and then you need one more team somewhere, and then that's eight, yeah. right? Yeah. No, that's that's eight there that's because eight, yeah. I've added three. I've added three more. Yeah. yeah. So that's your eight teams there, right? And that's where you start at. And you need, and then you know, you can try and steal fans or you could steal ideas for the NRL, have multiple Sydney based teams, have multiple Queensland based teams, you know, do whatever you, you need to do. If you're gonna make it that level of competition, then you need to push it like the NRL. You need to make it a fabric of the Australian sporting culture like the NRL is. Because arguably the super rugby is is not quite that at the moment. Right? It's yeah. it used to be and it and it's it's come off that, right? So if you're looking at if I'm going to take my clothing analogy, you know your NRL and your AFL are like your, your shirts and your uh, and your trousers, right? Essential items of clothing. The Super Rugby at the moment is like a scarf, right? <laughs> you don't need it, right? You can be tossed off at any moment, and you, you might be a little bit chilly, but you can you could do without it, kind of thing. It's not an essential part of the Australian sporting culture, uh, the fabric of the Australian sporting culture. So they need to work at integrating and making it that again. Right. Yeah. And but that's a whole thing about that's rugby union in general needs to be doing that in order to be uh, to, to thrive once more. 
Um, because it's at a tipping point. It yeah. really is at a tipping point of whether this sport is going to continue or whether it's going to um, crash and burn and go the way of other now obsolete sports like tug of war. <laughs> like so, tug of war used to be an Olympic sport. Yeah, like it used to be a serious thing, and now it's yeah, gone. It is, and uh, uh, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, I don't think rugby's going to head down that path, but I like, I do like, I see what you're yeah. saying, and I get what you're saying. So I guess. If your if choices in your hands, are you are you are you leaving Super Rugby Pacific? No, no, okay. I, w- I wouldn't leave. I yeah. would I would stay because the teams this year show they were competitive, um, it, and it's always great to beat New Zealand. And if we we can't do that as the Wallabies, we could do that in Super Rugby though. <laughs> it's seemingly this year, so we at least get that those wins. We get those wins there, uh, and I do like that we can. I guess what it enables us to do which we've seen with players like Charlie Gamble, and we saw it for the Crusaders, uh, is that you can sort of cross-breed players. You can grab some players from New Zealand. If you sort of stick to domestic-only leagues, players are probably not going to want to like kind of cross a- a- as much. So yeah. I think it allow- and allows you to learn from your opponents a bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me kind of give my thought on the situation. Now, I think the timing was terrible. I don't think it yeah. needed to be done during a final build-up. But, yeah. again, I think it is what it is. I also don't mind what they've done Australian rugby to a point, and it, it may sound weird from a New Zealand, that, like, damn right they need to be looking at everything across the board. Mm. Like, if they're not looking at absolutely everything, coming into a World Cup year, or the, the hosting the World Cup, was it 27 are you hosting, I think? Um, mm-hmm. you After 23, like, obviously that World Cup, you know, say you win it, then it doesn't. It takes a bit of stick off whatever this is, but let's say you don't win it in Australian rugby. You need to be thinking, how can we get to the point where we're winning a World Cup on home soil and what's the best yeah. way for that to happen? Now, do I believe it's leaving Super Rugby Pacific or New Zealand Super Rugby? No, I don't think it is. But I don't think you have the depth or the talent pool to be able to go to eight teams. Like we mentioned it there, I don't think the yeah. support is there enough for eight teams. Saying that, if you do a six-team kind of comp, like we said, maybe a Barbarians team in there to start with, and it's a Super Rugby AU, and they've got like a, again, like the, the idea is they like Fiji and Dura, so I think Dura stay in it, so you probably don't even have a Barbarians team. I think they like the idea of being able to bring Japanese teams back into it, so I think they'll probably poach a couple of Japanese teams in there. And I think you'd yeah. have a European club championship style thing where New Zealand Super Rugby teams or New Zealand teams, whatever happens in New Zealand, I guess, play midweek games, stuff like that. So you've got the two tournaments going at the same time. So you'll still, yeah. I think you still, there'll still be a relationship there. Like, he, although he's saying that, think about this. And, and again, this is why I don't mind what he's saying, because let's say they go up against the NRL and manage to get a good 10 team, <coughs> or even a 12 team, like we said, the perfect number 12 team comp with yep. eight Australian-based teams, Fiji and, let's say, three Japanese teams. Japanese teams. Let's yeah. say they get that 12, and let's say it's a decent enough comp. Rivaling NRL, obviously never going to beat the NRL for at least 20 years unless they produce something fantastic. So we say, like, okay, rivaling yeah. the NRL. Then you get a midweek fixtures against, you know, New Zealand Super Rugby teams called the, you know, Oceania Championship or the, you know, Asian Championship, yeah. um, a- Asian Champions League, whatever you want to call it. Those games are the ones that will heighten up crowds, you know, get people, you know, you're playing these New Zealand Super Rugby teams yeah. now once in a blue moon, you know, you've if you did say you've got to finish top four to, to get into this, you know, so then you've got yep. four teams. Now, what I think as well is from a New Zealand rugby perspective, it's not the worst thing to think about in the world. Like, everyone was like, oh, a New Zealand rugby, oh, they want to leave. Well, why do we need Super Rugby in New Zealand? Like, everyone who thinks about rugby thinks about the NPC and how great that was when it was at its height and how far that has fallen. Like I think that's the fear of New Zealand rugby is the fall of Super Rugby to be like the NPC where we used to have stadiums full of NPC, now we have nothing. You get your All Blacks back playing in that, you know, and all of a sudden that becomes our premier competition over this period now. You know, instead of just squishing it into here, we could even go to a divisional format. I saw someone do it, I might pull it up and put it on, where there was free division format and we do a very English style of rugby it's now those clubs coming up um, style of rugby and then those teams go into you know those plays so you're not seeing the Hurricanes or playing the Hurricanes and like you said it may have to be the the Sydney Waratahs and then the Newcastle Hunters or whatever they are Um, again playing 
you know, the Wellington Lions, the Auckland Blues, rather yep. than it actually being oh, the Auckland Blues or the Auckland rugby team, who I assume they're going to call themselves the Blues still, you know, the Canterbury yep. Rams or whatever they call themselves. So I think that would that could work. It could work, don't get me wrong. And I go, yep. if I'm Australian rugby, don't be just saying this as an, an empty fret either, if you know what I mean. Yep. Don't push New Zealand Super Rugby's or New Zealand Rugby to go, actually, let's have a think about our own development here. Like, is this what we want to be doing? Should we be doing it some other way? Is there actually something we could be doing better here? And then all of a sudden they go here. Because the the reason this is mainly coming up is the $71 million New Zealand rugby gets from Sky Sport to do their TV rights deal. So they get $71 million. On the other, on the flip side, I think it's 29 for Stans and, and Channel 9's um, deal for Australian rugby, for Super Rugby. So, you know, $100 million and you're getting 70% versus 30%. You're going to be asking some questions. Now, that's not completely yeah. on New Zealand rugby because... It's obviously more of an interest in New Zealand rugby. There's more money there. That's the TV deal. Now, could we even this out? Yes, of course. We we as New Zealanders don't want the game to die, like you said, and become a tug of war. So we'd rather a strong Australia than no Australia, if you know what I mean. But I think, yep. yeah, it's just this playing ground that they have every right and I believe they need to observe everything and look into everything. But don't be rash with your fret making because that could backfire yep. as well. You know what I mean. 100%. I actually really like the the idea of um, leaving Super Rugby but continuing to work with Rugby NZ um, in terms of sort of, like you said, and we start developing a, um, even if Australian Rugby doesn't include the Japanese teams, but if we start to have like a three conference system or even possibly developing to four conference system where you might have Right, uh, you've got New Zealand Rugby Conference, Australian Rugby Conference, Japanese Rugby Conference, and then you might have like a Pacific Rugby Conference, or you could have um, Arge- Argentinian in there, like Pacific and Argentinian Conference, right? And then you do have like that uh, European Champions League style midweek game or something like that, or you have, uh, you know, or you, you set aside or in some of like the bye weeks um, for Super Rugby is you play those games in their championship style. You have a couple of groups, right? And then you have like a, a championship and things like that. So end of Super Rugby season, you have um, the the championships, right? Uh, yeah, like the, the, the representative or championship rounds, right? Um, so, you know, you ha- might have like, say we start out with like six teams in Australian Super Australian Conference, the top two teams go in. Say New Zealand Rugby has six teams, you add those in. I don't know how many teams are in the Japanese Super League or whatever it's called, but say they, they have six teams, whatever, they, you have the top two from that, and then the Pacific slash Argentinian, you add more in there or you have less. You know, you could have, uh, you know, we've got Fiji and we've got Moana Pacifica, you know, let's add add some more and let's try and get some more going there or whatever. But you say you've got, even if we just have three conferences to start with, right, then you've got a, a six-team um, championship, let's say, right, yep. where, you know, two from Australian Conference, two from New Zealand, two from Japan, right, and you have two groups of um, two groups of three, and then the top two from each group go through one versus four, two versus three. Um, so you've got a semi final, then you've got a final. Great, that's that's so in essence, the finals is two weeks of competition, and then you've got um, in the group stages, each team will have to play um, two games, right? So that's um, two weeks of competition there. So that's only four weeks, yeah, or whatever, or four extra games. Right, but it's still very doable. Yeah, that's that's not a, a lot of extra weight to put on these teams, but it adds more of that um, exciting competition, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I'd like to. That's that that uh, that would be a cool idea. I think that would vary things up, make it a bit more interesting, and yeah. It, but it, it all comes down to the core, and it's the core question that we sort of said we've we talked about for weeks is rugby Australia has to do something to revive interest in the game here in Australia and the world cup is a great start to it. Um, but there need, but there needs to be more from the, from the bottom up. It needs to be re it needs to be rebuilt. It needs to be revived. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and I think like, like you said, like there's so many ways you could do it. So that's why I don't yeah. think the statements as bad as it is. Just don't make sure it's not an empty threat. Like please yeah. to rugby Australia, be looking into all of these possible ways. Like yep. even if it's a club, like look into a club competition, just someone r- sit down and go, <laughs> okay, how many people have we yep. got signed up at Gordon rugby? How many people have we got signed up at uh, university of Queensland rugby? Like 
who are how many people like are watching this on stand or whatever it is like you know just look into every figure to go maybe it's a comp competition yeah. maybe it's this maybe it's that maybe it's this look into every option and and actually come back to us with something that's like going to be like actually this is an idea this is what we're pitching to New Zealand rugby this yeah. is what we're pitching don't just make this all about oh we want the TV rights if, if it's going to be doing this do something about it but I think yeah there's, yeah. there's definitely grounds for it I think Super Rugby specific was great and I don't think we should leave that idea yet, but I do. I, do, I just. I think the discussion should be how we're going to best improve this one, and I think it's, that's that's probably the most disappointing thing from this. Is it's been more of like, oh, we're going to think about ideas. Well, surely New Zealand rugby and Australian rugby should sit down together and go, what is going to be the best for this comp? Like, yep. this, even if these two years, you can say again, this has been COVID affected. The Dura have made a great entrance, like you said, they could be in this comp somewhere along the way, somewhere. But I just think, yeah, there is there is. Room to improve, and I think we're if, as long as we're looking, yeah. both sides are looking into that. Why isn't that a good thing? Yeah, exactly. I think there's there's probably a bit of media, um, sort of uh, headline making there and, and portraying it as a bit more negative than probably what uh, the CEO actually intended it to to be. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's got people talking about rugby, so you know, 100%. at this stage, honestly, for Australian rugby. Almost all press is good press. I'm not going to say <laughs> even bad press is good press because it's not. It's not. There are some cases where it's just not. But almost any kind of press is is good at this stage. So, I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, this is the kind of stuff as well that you need to get like interest sort of back in the game. I mean, you look at what Peter Volandis did for the NRL during COVID. Yeah. He he brought that competition through and is arguably making it even more popular now in that he, he managed to put on a competition during COVID and he came out and made big statements that we're not afraid to look at anything, you know, took away two referees to, to make it one, um, had a full COVID bubble and said he would land hard on anyone that would, would, would break those protocols and they did. And as, as I can, as I know, like, <laughs> um, yeah, no. haven't been able to look at a barbecue the same way since, but uh, yeah, 100%. I think there's, there, there's, you need to make these big statements. Like it, now is not the time to be conservative. And again, like, now is the time yeah. to make the bold statements and back it up. And again, like you said, I, I mean, I still don't know the rugby CEO's name, but I know you've got a CEO who's willing to put his foot yeah. down. Like again, I, I, I wouldn't know his name to, to, if it, were, if it popped right in front of me and I would be like, oh, yeah, that's the Australian rugby yeah. CEO, but at least he's putting something out there and you know, you've got someone thinking, um, I will say just to finish off on this point, I still think my idea from last week's podcast of a Super Rugby <laughs> AU season extended at the end of this year will work really well with this. Like you could definitely yeah. do two Super Rugby seasons in a year um, and just have one be Super Rugby Pacific and one be, you know, even if you called it the Australian Provincial Competition, I know it's not provinces, yeah. but, you know, it could work. There's definitely, I think that would probably be one, the route I think I would take first before I went into anything else, but... Yeah, like we said, there's room for growth. Um, but moving on from Super Rugby, a a pretty interesting result uh, early this morning mm. uh, when we woke up to England being trounced by the Barbarians. Uh, I think it was 52-21 in the end, I believe. It was, and the Barbarians were playing with 14 men for most what, of the game. Because an Aussie. Skeleton. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're the, making history, mate. He's making history. The first ever Barbarian sent off. Oh, Lordy, yes. So, yes, the Barbarians. He even, he even uh, I loved it because I watched the footage of when they were judging that, and then um, as the referee's handing down the verdict, he's like, yes. Like, agreeing with everything the referee says. Like, you put your shoulder in, he'd pass the ball, you had time to stop. He's like, yes, yes. And he's like, you're gone, mate. And he's just like... Sorry, sir. <laughs> <And then walked laughs> off. Like he knew, he knew he he fucked it up. Going, so yeah, that's that was my favorite part of the whole thing. I think yeah, obviously it was fucking stupid, but it was funny how he just sort of it's like a school kid. Like and this is big, tall Will Skelton we're talking about, six foot. Fuck Eight. off, however tall he is. Yeah, and just like staring down at this little referee, like yes, sir. Sorry, sir. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, you can't take too much from this game. It's an exposition game. Mm. It's the barbarians. You know, you got. Locks from England doing back heel kicks over for conversions, but it does send a message. You know, a half of at least half of England squad wasn't there from uh, the Saracens mm. versus Leinster final, I believe it was um, uh, earlier in that day or, or or the day beforehand. So yeah, you you can't take too much from that, but. I mean, if you're a Wallabies well, if you're English, fan, you can. They want it. They want Eddie Jones' Jones's head. head. I can't based believe on some it. Of the, <laughs> yeah, based on some of the articles I'm reading, I'm like this is the guy that took your team to a World Cup final, yeah. like no, not that long ago. I love. There's a video going around, and he's like 
rugby is still meant to be fun, guys. I don't know if you've seen it in the yeah. presser, and they just they're deadbeat. They are they do not yeah. give them a, an inch. And I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah. this is why we hate the English. The like, English again, yeah. like you know, like this is just the reason. Like I said, I'd never ever wear a Wallabies jersey unless I absolutely yeah. physically had to. But I, I I'd still wear an English jersey. But I would, I would rather Aussie beat the English. Like I, I've loved I've loved what the Aussies are doing. The first bit of, you you said to spend some money on marketing. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen Taniella Tupo's ad on Stan. And no. he goes into a high tea party with a bunch of English. It is fantastic. <laughs> I, I'll share it again if I'm able that. to um, on our page as well. Because if you haven't seen that, watch that. Because it yeah. is just that's that is exactly what they need to be doing. Firing it up yeah. in the series. Personalities going. again, and and he yeah, is you need personalities. Fantastic. Like I follow him on Instagram, and and he was hitting uh, a bunch of the. Uh, Wallaby sides with cards in the head because they'd lost a um, card game to him and he's just he honestly just wants to make you laugh the whole time so I think that's fantastic yep. and, and I must say a good thing we're about to come up and talk about NRL but over in Perth State of Origin 2 still yet to be sold yep. out whereas England versus the Wallabies has sold out I mean that's a mm. that's a pretty big statement for rugby yep. over there to rugby league is you know rugby league the State of Origin 2 hasn't yet sold out but the Wallabies were able to sell it out pre pre and even get in there. So I think you've got a pretty And that's with zero Western Force players in, in the squad, squad right? exactly. Yeah. So there, yeah. there's there's just die hard, hardy Wallabies fans over there. So I think that's that's good. It's gonna be a great series and this is just kinda again, the, like you said, rugby in the news, this gets you know, the Wallabies in the news all of a sudden because England yeah. like rugby are coming here and they've just lost and it's like, oh, I've, I've, this series could be one for the making and, and the Wallabies are looking good in camp um, from what I'm saying as well. Yeah. You know, one of the, in like sort of, I guess, the time when I was sort of growing up and watching rugby, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, right? Some of the, you know, ways that people like fell in love with rugby or fell in love with the Wallabies was the personalities on the team, like Matt Giddo, um, Phil Warren, stuff like that. Like they had, they had great ads on TV using these players for other brands, right? Like I remember it was, it was like a Wolf Blast or maybe it was a beer ad or something. Where it was Matt, you know, kicking a ball and he does it, you know, he does his lean as he kicks the ball, <laughs> and like everyone else was like copying the lean, and they even had like like people physically leaning and like the the rooms leaning and stuff, and the glass of wine was like leaning and stuff. <laughs> or you had Phil War, you know, like jumping into an ice bath and re- reacting to stuff like that, um, and just like f- you know, personalities, right? That's what gets people. That's what makes people interested in the NRL as well. Like you look at the most popular players in the NRL, and they're all personalities. You know, like Cameron Munster is a massive personality, right? Yeah. And and it boosts it boosts the boosts the game. Um, and these players are active on social media and stuff as well. And I'm sure the Rugby Australia players are as well. But, um, yeah, get, getting those personalities out there through advertising, you know, I think that's, you know, and getting the, that that's, I think, a path Rugby Australia really needs to take. Because, yeah, hearing stuff from, like, Tanya Latupo doing that, like, yeah, that's great. That's an ad for Rugby Australia, right? But that's, that's hitting fans, I guess, that are, Already. Uh, already in the rugby Australia circle, you need to be hitting people that are outside the circle and bringing them in. I do so, think, I do think, yeah. yeah, saying that like a good point, very good point. But I think that this will hit a few fans and go like, yeah, what is this? What is this ad? And it was like to me, it was yeah. like starting off. I was like, oh, it, was, it was very good. So I think it's rugby yeah. Australia ticking the right on the right there. path. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll have to share that with you. But I believe you yeah. have a question now, uh, for me, Hughesy. Yes, for a few yeah, times. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. I finally, I've got, I've got a. Big question for you because watching this final, um, not only was it a, a match of the top of the best two New Zealand rugby teams, the two best teams in Super Rugby Pacific, but it was also a battle between two players in a key position for the All Blacks, and that is position of um, fly half or first five or number ten, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, and of course, that's uh, between Bowden Barrett and Richie Moanga. Now, um, I have, I'm going to ask you, Luke, as a All Blacks fan, New Zealand rugby fan, yep. after watching that game, who do you pick at 10 for the All Blacks? Or do you go for outside of those two and go for a complete wild card, like uh, captain of Knox All Boys' first <laughs> grade team, Luke Bowden? Oh, uh, yeah, myself. I'd definitely put myself in there. I'm in fine form, yeah. I can tell you that. Fuck, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My tackle percentage may be below 50%. Uh, no, <laughs> I would say, look... <coughs> My my belief hasn't changed since the start of the season, and I'm not the biggest Richie Moonga fan out there. But I have Moonga starting at ten and Barrett off the bench. Purely, I think Barrett offers more off the bench. I think 
uh, than Moonga offers off the bench. And then when you go, so like the way I see it is, if you're ranking them both, I go as a first five like nine point two to Barrett, Moonga nine point one. Then I go off the bench, I go Barrett nine, Moonga seven. Like I don't think Moonga can add what Barrett can add off the bench. So I've always kind of thought Moonga has to start at ten. Although I think Barrett is just slightly the better player. What I've seen from Moonga this season has just decidedly made that fact 100% that Moonga needs to start at 10. Uh, the only way I'd see Barrett starting at 10 is if TJ Perinara came back into the squad because I think when TJ Perinara starts with Barrett, that's when Barrett looks the best because of the years they played together. Um, I Honestly, I've, I'm have i so caught up on Bryn Hall at the moment. I The way he performed in that final, I'm so disappointed he's leaving for Japan next year um, because I think him and Moonga's relationship is is one of the best in the world at the moment, like the way they seem to play together. So I would start Moonga at 10 um, and then Barrett off the bench. I still, I think, I honestly believe both Barrett should come off the bench. Geordie, I, I think all three Barrett should come off the bench. That's how I, I think Scott Barrett, because I think Tupavai and Sam Whitelock uh, uh, are our locks. And then I think it should be Will Jordan at the back. But I think I'm going to be told off that that won't be the case by Fozzie. But yeah, that, that's what I would do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I would uh, I would agree with that. I just, yeah, I think Mwanga in, in this final really stamped uh, his position as the as a starting 10. He's um, just, he just looked, he just took it to a, another level. He's just been playing brilliantly. Yeah, I mean, the one the one great thing about the Crusaders being good normally means the All Blacks are going to be good. And if that yeah. forward pack can do what they did to the Blues forward pack against South Africa... Anyone could play 10, man. That was, they destroyed them. Mm. However, I don't think that ever happens because the South African fall back are a different beast. Let's move on to the NRL. All righty. The good, bad, and the ugly. Um, I'm going to let you go first just purely because there's a couple of things I want to hold back on before we get on to sure. mine. So uh, in a rare occurrence, I'm going to let you go first. Okay. Well, my good for the week. I mean, I mean, how, how do I go past the Dragons, especially the first half against the Rabbitohs, I thought I... Um, so I actually started watching the game five minutes late and I already missed one try. Um, that's how quickly the Dragons <laughs> opened the, the scoring on that one. And then they just rang in try after try after try and you're just looking at it. And it was more for me like, what is going on with the Rabbitohs here? Yeah. But the I was, Dragons Hold on, hold on, Husey. I was ex- going to let you start, but I'm actually... I'm going to take over because I know this is your okay. good and I, I have to... So I, first of all, I have to apologise to all the Dragons fans for saying you guys wouldn't win yeah. to August because... Yeah. A, firstly, I was proven wrong, which sometimes happens. Not often, but sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, and B, not only was I proven wrong, I was, like, dismantling proven wrong, like, the proven yeah. the most wrong you could prove. So I want to set the scene. Obviously, I've said all the statements about how shit the Dragons are, <coughs> not winning to August, getting under Husey's mm. skin. Um, I'm out training Thursday night as a good, you know, captain with a 50% below tackle rate does. Um, and obviously tra- training my clearance kicks because I don't tackle practice. Uh, and all of a sudden I've got my, you know, Apple Watch on. I'm, I'm tracking my stats because everyone got to know I've at least run two Ks this training. <coughs> and all these messages start popping through. And it's from Husey and it's like talking about calendar. And I'm like, what's this? Is this guy, you know, talking about some Roman myth or some shit? He's on calendars <laughs> and this. And I see some numbers popping up. I'm thinking it's Roman numerals going on. All of a sudden someone comes around and goes, the Dragons are up 32 nil. I stopped training. I had to stop training. I go, you're fucking bullshitting me. Someone find us a result. Yeah. This isn't happening. They're not 32 nil. I look at the clock. It's only been like 30 minutes. I'm like, they can, someone's yeah. yanking my fucking chain. We stop training. Someone gets a phone out, 32 nil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take it away from their Dragons fans. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the, the what you saw from the... It's, what... Uh, what impressed me the most about this game was actually the the second half from the Dragons. Now, normally the Dragons will crumble away, will crumble away and will let teams back in the games, right? But even when they were down a man with Talata Amon off for, I think it was a questionable send-off. I think it was a penalty, no doubt. I don't know if it was send-off worthy, considering that Nichols was sort of already tackled and it, was, it, was, it wasn't a try, saving play, and Walker didn't go down until after Nichols was held on the ground. Um, so... I, I was impressed with their resilience in the second half. Um, Souths made 
a number of necessary changes defensively, and they weren't giving the Dragons much to work with an attack. But the Dragons sort of dug in and just did their did their job. They didn't try and overplay their hand. They had the lead, and they 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 knew that the second half was going to be a different beast for the first half. That being said, in the first half, what I really liked was Talatau Amon seemingly has grown in confidence week after week, and we're seeing the benefits of this now, where he's setting up tries, he's stepping through the line in gaps that players shouldn't be able to to step through, right? And this is a, a young kid, like I think he's 19. I think he's 19. Yeah, he's, like, 19 he's very, 20, very young. He's, he's 20. Yeah, he's, yeah, 20. He's, 20. Old, he's 20. He's 20. He turned. He was 19 at the start of the year. He's 20 now. Like this is. A, he's a young kid. He's growing in confidence, and I like that he's been given a license to to play, and that. They're, they're not hooking him out of that six jumper like they did early in the season and giving it to Jack Bird. They sort of said, the, the jersey's yours now. And he's sort of doing that. They've done that with Cody Ramsey. At least that's what I hope that they've done. And he's getting better at fullback every week as well. And what I love from Cody Ramsey was his ball security, which is something he failed miserably at last year. But this this week, he showed up. He trapped a couple of balls right by the goal line, like um, grubber kicks through from Cody Walker and everything like that. And they just tra- he just trapped it. Very secure hands. Um but even better than, and what's most important is that on a lot of these attacking plays, what we scored tries off in the first half was offloading, which is something the Dragons have been horrific at all year. Terrible in support runs, the Dragons. The, someone will make a break and there'll be no one there to support them. That was vastly improved uh, in the first half as well. So that needs to be a consistent effort from the Dragons. I don't think it's any... Uh, so I don't think it's any coincidence that as Jaden Sewer has gotten back on the field and more healthy, the Dragons have improved. I think he's a core part of that team. I think Aaron Woods needs to see the field less because the first try that got let through was Damian Cook like underneath Aaron Woods' legs because Aaron Woods can't bend over anymore, right? So Aaron Woods is a defensive liability. I think he had some good meters carrying the ball. Blake Laurie looked phenomenal, um, in my, my opinion, for someone of his body structure. Uh, so yeah, a great show for the Dragons. Of course... You've got to look at the flip side of it and say the South Souths were definitely not on their game and definitely looked horrific. Um, and then they didn't concede any points in the second half after they had a bit of a, a talking to. Um, so I think a little bit of realism is needed there. But you look at the ladder of of the competition now, and this will lead me into my bad for the round. Uh, and the Dragons are at eight, and you look at the teams below them, they've all got negative records. And they've got... They've got hard prospects coming up from here, right? So um, this brings me to my bad for the round. Uh, and I'm going to actually come back to the good because there's more good in the round than just the Dragons. But you look at look at the bad. It's the Roosters with a negative win-loss record. Three quarters of the way through the season, I think we are now. And they've got a really tough slate ahead. Their next game is against um, Penrith. They're one in four in their last five games as well. So the Roosters have run into a wall of some kind this season where things are just not working for them. Uh, you look below that, you've got Manly. Um, and their next game is against the Storm, who are red hot right now as well. Uh, below that, you've got the Raiders, who have got to play the Dragons. So that'll be, a, I think, a determining of which of those two teams um, will be in the eight. And then below that, you've got the Knights, the Bulldogs, the Tigers, the Warriors, and one other team, uh, who we shall not name. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think any of those are a chance of making the eight. The Bulldogs have found some form recently, which is great. And they started to switch on. But I think yeah, below the Raiders, none of those teams are making the eight. But there is a distinct possibility that even with how bad Souths have played this week, that the Roosters don't make the top eight this year. Now, that has got to be sending alarm bells through Bondi. That there is a real chance that the Roosters end the season with a negative uh, record and miss out on the eight. And I think that is going to be, you know, if all the talks about the, the, you know, the salary cap not being a salary cap, it's a salary sombrero in, in uh, for the Roosters and things like that. I think it's going to be a hard look at how much talent's been let go over the last few seasons. And it's something I said, was saying to my, my family earlier in the year is that, you, you look at the Roosters and they're not as feared this year as I think they have been in previous years because a lot of talent has walked out of the door and had to retire. And so I think the the Roosters need to... Um, they splashed out some cash for Joseph Sawali, and I think that is paying off, but they need to splash some cash uh, elsewhere as well. So that was my bad for the round. Yeah, I mean... That's, sort of going sorry, back to the, I'm just going to jump in there. It's, it's, there's, there's a few interesting weeks coming up, and I like what you've, you've kind of built there. Like the, the Roosters don't have an easy run home, but you've got... You know, week 17, obviously, by round, you guys have got the Broncos and the Rabbits have the Knights. So let's say, again, that's that's a an up-in-the-air game because 
depending how what dragon side shows up, and then you've got a weakened yep. Broncos side most likely. But again, you and the Rabbitohs playing could potentially both get wins. Then in round eighteen, yep. you actually play the Roosters, which is very <laughs> interesting. You know, like again, that's going to be another yep. game after you've just said like you've got the Raiders coming up. Then the Roosters have the Knights. You have the Sea Eagles. So you've got like let's take that Broncos game out of it. You've got the Raiders. Roosters and the Sea Eagles. You've got three season defining games realistically. Yep. Um, before you know round twenty, if you say you win all three of those, as you as the Dragons, that's you're into the top eight as far as I'm concerned. That those those three teams. That's that's where it's at. Those three teams. The those four teams. It's just it's it's, it's an interesting. You know, I may have picked the Roosters as yep. as, fa- as winners, but yeah, it's you, you're not wrong. You are not wrong. Those are the and those are the teams that the Dragons have to beat to get. Uh, into the eight, right? So they've done well against teams lower on, yeah, on the ladder. I was so say other that, than, that's so, the point but, I was going to okay, point other, out. <laughs> yeah, other than other than the 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 team that we shall not name, they've won all of the games against the lower against teams below them this stage in the season. They've beaten the Roosters, they've beaten the Knights, they've beaten the Bulldogs, they've beaten the Tigers, they've beaten the Warriors twice, and now beating okay? the Rabbits who are on and they've beaten the, the Rabbits who are above them, but just by they've beaten stuff. the Rabbits who. That's yeah. The thing like so, that. yeah. So, that you know, if they can, if they can beat the, if they can beat the Roosters, the Sea Eagles, and the Raiders, that's all they need to do to get into the, the eight, right? You can, you might, you know, the the Broncos game's up in the air because the Dragons will be um, weakened as well with with Ben Hunt coming back from Origin uh, as well, uh, and he, he's he's the core of that team, right? But. I mean, they were competitive against the Panthers in their game against the Panthers this year. But other than that, the top teams have given them trouble. There's no two ways about it. Obviously, the Dragons have developed as the season's gone on. But they've beaten the teams below them, which, look, it sounds trite, I guess. But that's what you have to do to get in there. You have to beat the teams you're expected to beat. I just, I do want to just say one and the Roosters, thing. And I, I'm just going to say one thing as well with that. The Roosters haven't done that this year. They've lost... To the Bulldogs, they lost to the the Eels here as well. Who they who they should have been. They lost to the Raiders, who are lost to the Knights below them. At so some point, didn't they? Yeah, the they lost to the Knights season. first 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 week of the season. So I don't have much yeah. over you at the moment with the team we shall not name hanging at the bottom of the ladder yeah. and you hanging around the top eight. But if there's one thing we do have, we've beaten teams above us on the table. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, <laughs> well, we 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 have as well, right? We beat the Rabbitohs uh, and the Roosters were above us when we played on Anzac stuff. Day. Point stuff. That doesn't count. The, no. the, the Roosters, <laughs> no, but the Rabbitohs. Okay, every the team Rabbitohs that's were above you, us before right. this week. <laughs> We've beaten teams above us. Let's just move yeah. on. <laughs> we, every every team's above them. <laughs> but the, the Dragons uh, beat the Rabbitohs when they were above them, and they beat the Roosters when they were above them. Right. So the so they can they can do it. Right, it's not just when these teams are down or at low points; they can, they can oh, do it. Any team, but the, it needs, the, the question will be, yeah, the question will be again: Can if you get it, it's, it's the same question you could ask the Gold Coast Titans from last year? Can you yeah. beat a top four <coughs> side? Probably not. Like, let's be honest; no. like your Dragons aren't at that stage yet. No. Could you upset? I don't think you go on a run if you make the finals. But again, that's not to say yeah. we've got another eight more weeks where a lot more could happen if you start beating some of those teams. Then yeah. we'll start getting into those discussions. Continue on with your Absolutely. ugly Husey. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I just wanted to point out some other other goods around because I think they are worth mentioning. Um, and I, I, it, it is tough when we do these good, bad, and ugly because sometimes we miss some important goods. But these are some goods I'm going to go in. I'm just going to look at and, uh, but not go into too much detail. But I think they are worth mentioning. So uh, the Bulldogs winning, but also putting up over thirty points again, I think is really big for them considering their attacking woes early in the season. Um, the Raiders. Uh, I you I've got to give you props here because you said Jamal Fogarty would change this team and he definitely has. You can see he's really established himself as the center of this team. Um, uh, the the Eels pulling that out after on the Roosters after they got trounced by the Dogs the week before. Like where did that come from? Um, the the Cowboys not dominating a game but still coming out with a tough win. And I got to give some love to the Broncos for a tough game against the Storm in which they hung in. So they did they did some good stuff there. Now onto the ugly for the round though, and it is one of these teams that we've talked about a bit as being fairly ugly, and that is the Newcastle Knights, where they have snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in that game against the Raiders, where they you thought they'd done enough to get themselves across the line. There's two minutes left to go, and they led in a try um, by the Raiders and the. Uh, the kick is converted to give the Raiders a two-point margin. That was enough for them to win the game. So 
It's ugly for me in the fact that the, I think the, that would be so crushing for the Knights, where they finally were playing well. They'd stopped some good plays by the Raiders as well. They played tough and hard, and they still lost. So I think so. It's ugly for me in that it, how crushing it was for the Knights. I must say, I think Anthony Milford's made a uh, a massive return, and I think you can tell like, he's just yeah. He's a, he's a player. If he could get his <coughs> body and his mind in the right shape, you'd be like, man, this kid could play. But yeah. Because he's, mm. he's definitely making a difference for them um, and helps with taking some of that pressure off Ponga to, to, to show something. So, yeah, yeah it was tough. Uh, let me go through my good, bad, and ugly. Uh, I've obviously done my bad. I apologise to you, Dragons fans. Yeah, get out of here. Um, my ugly. I'm going to go into my ugly. Lachlan Elias. Elias. I don't quite know how you pronounce Elias. it. Elias. Lachlan Elias. Elias. Uh, getting pulled after 29 minutes. Now, the reason it's ugly is if you think being down 32-0 at, well, I mean, I think they were down 24-0 at the time or even 28-0 yep. at that point. And it was his just his fault <laughs> and you pull him. I, I've got another I've got another another statement for you, Mr. Uh, Demetrius, I think it is, the Rabbitohs coach, yep. because I just, I go, you wait to the 40-minute mark. This is a young half, like, wait to the 40-minute <laughs> mark, pull him off there, say, yep. look, son, we're going to try something different. Like, Doing it in the game when the cameras are on, like, you know, at least, at least if it was, you know, half, they have the chat in the changing rooms, they come back out, everyone sees Elias on the sidelines, he's prepped for it. Like, I just couldn't imagine that feeling coming from the yeah. side, you know, off the field to the sideline knowing you've been pulled when really it's a team, like, that's a, watching the Rabbitohs, when I watched back the highlights, I was like, man, I, I, the, the Dragons were, you know, I'll give them credit, but I think, uh, 80% of the league would have put, you know, 20 points on them in that first half at least. Yeah. Like, I just was like, there was some terrible defence. It wasn't just um, Lachlan. So I was just like, yeah, it, that that killed me a little bit inside. And I think JT, Jonathan Thurston said it as well. Like, that was that was pretty bad from, I thought, from the Rabbitohs. I don't think that would have happened under Wayne Bennett. But then again, Wayne Bennett no. probably wouldn't have let Adam Reynolds go. So you, you, <laughs> you know who looked actually really bad from the Rabbitohs, who I was really surprised because he's normally quite good, is Campbell Graham. He looked just, all out of Zach sorts. Loma, Jack, uh, Zach Lomax and Michaeli Ravalawa were just having their way with him. Yep. Um, like that, I mean, first of all, the flick pass from Lomax, the no-look <laughs> flick pass, was a thing of beauty. Hey, like, that hey was he got awful. told, this is the thing, we discussed it yeah. last week, he gets told off for these things, but because he can do it, like, he's so talentedly yep. gifted that he's going to try, and that's my issue, though, like, everyone was ripping on him last week, and it was like, this kid's got it, like, yep. just let him do what he yep. does, like, it's, he's going to have those weeks where some weeks it doesn't come off, and nothing will come off, and you'll <laughs> lose a game because of it, but some weeks... He'll lead you to victory like he did there. But yeah, so yeah. that was my ugly. Uh, my good, I, I didn't I couldn't find a lot of good look. I looked through the results and you like you said the Bulldogs, but I was like, it's the Tigers. Come on, like come on at the moment. Yeah. Then I was like, yeah, the Broncos put up a fight, but they still lost. Um I was like, the Sharks and Titans game, neither team like the Titans look better, but the Sharks still won. The Warriors and the Panthers, yeah. like, do anyone expect any different? Like oh, a whole lot. I was just like, it kind of was as expected. So what I actually really enjoyed was seeing the reps at footy sides named and not Queensland. Yeah. New South Wales, but actually the New Zealand Kiwis, the uh, <coughs> Samoan team, the Fijian team, the uh, Tongan team is looking extraordinarily strong mm. um, and will be a hell of a good side heading into a game against the Kiwis. I, I believe it's at Mount Smart or even Eden Park, just about, I, I think I saw there. So I was I was just fascinated seeing those teams. I think that's to see the strength of those sides now, it's like, oh, okay, you know, this is getting up there. To This, this is what international rugby league needs like you know again we yeah. don't see it as much that those teams that's not the height of of the game but it's becoming it and you know like i know katoni stags obviously missed out on the blues but he put his hand up for the blues over tonga but it was 50 50 like I, even 51 49 you could tell he he really wanted yeah. to it was only i think if he had had, had a fantastic performance and for the blues i think he wanted some redemption to but he won't get it but yeah i just i think that was a really cool side of of the league this week yeah. But let's move on to state of origin naming quickly. Yes. There's not a lot yeah. to talk about I mean, on the Queensland slide, so we can take that off. Murray yeah, Tui Lange. You, you go first. Murray Tui Lange comes in for the injured Xavier Coates. Lindsay Collins starts. Tino goes to hook, uh, to hook it to uh, lock, and uh, as Cotta is out injured. That's it. Necessary changes. Uh, it was yeah. Co it was Oates or Tui Lange. I prefer Tui Lange, um, but I think you could have gone either one. Uh, and mm. then, yeah, it could have been Tino or Kerrigan to start, but what Kerrigan did off the bench, 
I really like Tino starting and Lindsay Collins yeah. starting. Take us through the New South Wales ones, mate. Right, so a few a few changes here, and I have to say I am a fan of all of them. So Matt Burton in the centres, I think is great because he then has Brian Toto there, who he you know played with previously. Uh, Stephen Crichton is the other centre. Uh, Daniel Tupo for stays on the on the wing. Obviously James Sturz goes at fullback, but Daniel Tupo stays in the wing. So this was a question mark for me: was whether Tupo would be pulled or not for Josh Adokar. That might have been the one change I would I would make, but I think uh, that Freddie wanted to. You know, Tupo didn't play poorly uh, in that game, so I don't think he wanted to, you know, punish him for others' mistakes or for the game plan kind of thing. So I think Tupo did enough to earn his, to keep his spot. I think the, the Fox has been in such good form though that I, I'm surprised he wasn't even included in the extended squad. Um, but I think Freddie knows that he doesn't need to keep him in the extended squad because he can pull him in when he needs to, and he wants to give some of these other players a bit of blooding in an Origin camp. So I could see the reasoning behind that there, even if the media is going to be outraged, like, oh, the Fox is not even in the extended squad. It's like, yeah, well, he doesn't need to be. He's been here, done that, right? Uh, so I think that's fine. Luai and Cleary, six and seven, that wasn't going to change. Uh, but then we start, the forwards is where the majority of the changes have happened and the bench. And I think this is where uh, things needed to change for uh, the Blues. So Payne Haas at eight, same as game one, played quite well. Appy Corusau, though, starting at hooker with Cook on the bench. I'm a big fan of this change because I think New South Wales saw what Queensland did in the first game and realized this is probably what we should have been doing. Um, and I think everyone was surprised they didn't do it in game one. Uh, you're looking... I guess the the way you, you kind of can look at your hookers in origin is the way that you look at your halfbacks in, in rugby union where you've got, uh, but in rugby league, you could sub back on after you've been subbed off. Uh, so you, you give someone a chance to play because it's an extremely tough position. I, I think some people call it the hardest position to play in rugby league because you've got to be everywhere doing everything, tackling as well as being there offensively as well. Splitting those duties between the two of them, I think Appy Corris has a really tough nugget of a player, like a like a Ben Hunt. Not completely comparable, but I think they bring the similar things to the table. Whereas Damian Cook has got a bit more X factor about him, like what Harry Grant does, where he can make some of those runs at a dummy half. So bringing Cook on fresh, you know, 30 minutes into the game when the forwards are starting to get tired in the middle and things like that, and allowing him a bit more room to play, I think is a, is a good thing. And I don't think it should be seen as a demotion of um, Damian Cook because anyone that tells you that Harry Grant's been demoted in Queensland <laughs> side, side because he's on the bench is a fucking idiot. So I think it's more of a recognition of what Cook's skills are and that he doesn't need to play 80 minutes, right? He is that good. He doesn't need to play 80 minutes though. And you've got, we've got enough talent elsewhere to support that. Um, Jake Roy, comes back into the side uh, and is going to be starting front row. And I think that's necessary for the defensive uh, lack that the, that New South Wales sort of had in the, in the first game. Um, he's just he's just tough. And that's the same with Cameron Murray, who comes to the starting side with Liam Martin. Tarek Sims completely axed, which I think is a good thing. I don't think she, he should have been in the squad in the, the first place. I saw, and I I said when we looked at the first side, but I could see what Freddie Fiddler's doing here. You need someone who's a bit of a, a, a tough C word. Like, you, you, you could see what he's there for, but he hasn't been playing up to that. And I think Liam Martin does give you that in place of him. Also worth noting, Regal, Regan Campbell-Gillard axed as well. Partially on but partially as well because he got put on uh, report this week. So I think Freddie was worried about his availability. Um, Liam, uh, Isaiah, you at 13. He's not going to go away from there. He nearly won the game right at the end for us. And then we got Damian Cook, Angus Crichton back into the side on the bench. I think he's an origin player and he deserves his spot. Junior Paolo. And then probably the most interesting selection for New South Wales. And I think the one that may make or break this series is uh, COC for Talakai on the bench in the jersey number 17. So a versatile player who could play in the centres, but he's also played back row. So who knows where he's going to slot in when he comes on the field, but he's a wrecking ball of a player, which I think is good for New South Wales to have that physicality, but also the speed that he has and the ball playing ability. So he is sort of a Swiss army knife, put him in anywhere and he'll play well for you. He could play front row. That's how big he is. Like, I I honestly think that he he's got the ability to to make it work. And you know, if you see Crichton or Burton struggling a little bit in the centres, you could slot him in there. Or you've got an injury. You know, that's the great thing about the side is that the, is the versatility, right? So you know, say one of your halves get injured, you slot Burton into the, the slot there, and you put Talakai in the centres. Say. Uh, you know, you you one of your setters get injured, you just put Talakai in there as well. Like you've got versatility all over the part. You know, say even Tedesco uh, gets injured there, you can slot 
um, Luai or Cleary back there at fullback, or you put Stephen, sorry, you put Stephen Crichton back there at fullback, <laughs> where he's played before as well for for Penrith, and then you put in Talakainen. So I, I like the versatility and flexibility um, that he brings, but it's not just that that he brings; it's also his ability as a player. So uh, yeah, it's and then you've got your extended squad of Hines as 18th man, Joseph Swali, Jordan McLean, Clint Gutherson, and Victor Radley. I think those the last four players there, Swali, McLean, Gutherson, Radley, is just to get them some more time with the origin team if they're ever called upon. I'm I'm just I'm really interested. Like I am like this I feel like is a <coughs> line in the sand just about thing for Freddie Footler because the amount mm. of changes that you've made from losing a six point game um doesn't like yeah, it doesn't scare me. It makes it makes me intrigued. Like I'm like that is a lot like Regan Campbell Gillard didn't play that badly. Like if you, if you were talking about, you know, no. Tupo didn't play that badly. We we're also saying RCG didn't play that badly. I go, would I like I, the what the Burton one surprises me, and it hasn't been mentioned much in the media. But this this guy's played half, or, you know, six five eight for you know the whole season. Probably trained there the whole season. I don't know when's the last time he would have trained at centre, and you're pulling him into camp. You're saying what about Whiten? Yeah, 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 yeah. But Whiten's a completely, I think, different beast. Whiten's built as a centre who's plays six. Burton is a six build. Like he's not as big or as, as strong as as Whiten. That's he was the Dalian centre of the year last year. Uh, and I get that. And 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 again, I'm not saying he's not a bad centre. But if you go to me, would I rather see Burton and Katoni Stags out there? I'd rather see uh, I'd rather see Burton out there. Like I, it's not again. I think he's a fantastic player. Do not get me wrong. This isn't at me vibing or jibing at Burton because I think Burton is an outstanding player. I think eventually we'll get himself into the six jersey for the Blues, and because I think he's a better player than Luai. But I go, I just don't think in a in a state of origin series if it's Val Holmes or Gagai defending up on him I don't think he's he's the type of job and this it reminds me heavily of just Clint Gufferson playing centre a, a couple of years ago where he was just so out of his his depth there not because he's a bad player like Clint Gufferson's a great player but it's just it's a whole new ball area now I think Burden's going to be better than Gufferson I don't think it'll be that bad I don't I just don't mm. think he's going to shine as much as he did when he was playing for a Panthers centre and became Panthers. De- 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 I just think it's an interesting selection for a guy who's played so well at six. It's not like the centres, I think, cost you the game in that in that game one. Mm. Uh, and then I guess, yeah, the the, the forward makeup interests me as well. Jake Travoyevic coming back in, and I, I get it. Again, I don't think he's as much of a mediator as an RCG, so it doesn't fear me on that end, but he is defensively stronger. I think, again, Cam Murray and Liam Martin... Are they uh, better than Tarek Sims? I, be- I I believe that's a better pick. And the bench, I, I like Talakai being in there. Like you said, he can break a game over, g- game open if necessary. It just, it does scream a slight bit of desperation when you've made so many changes. Even to that, I know you like you said, and you made a good point with the experience. But you know, there's no way Jordan McLean's better than RCG. Like I, I just don't see that. And I go, you get those guys' experience, but what about like that environment of the camp, that culture of in the team? It just it, it interests me. There's more points that interest me. And again, I'm not saying this because I think it's going to blow up in your face. I don't know how this is going to turn out. This could be the best decision Freddie's made, and he's gone. Actually, game one we got it so wrong, we had to change this. But I don't think you got it so wrong. So I'm just, it's just, it's let's say let's just happen to say Queensland go up and pump them by thirty. That's a this is an an astronomical disaster for Freddie Vitler. You go, yep. what the hell just happened? Now say. New South Wales goes out there and pump them by 30. You go, you're you're a genius for it. You obviously saw what was wrong and you picked up what was wrong. Now, I don't know what, no, yep. none of us know what's going to happen, but even if it's a close game, let's say it's a close game and Queensland win, I go, I think there's going to be a lot more media scrutiny scrutiny on the changes, even if it's a close game and Queensland win. If Queensland come yep. out way with a win here, I just think there's going to be a lot of finger pointing at, oh, yeah. at this and that. 100%. So it's just, it interests me. You know, you... You yeah. know, like we've had this discussion, the seven years of domination and everything like that, and now you know you look like this is going to be a strong New South Wales side, and there's just a lot of changes straight away. Any any time New South Wales loses a series, there's always finger pointing. See, that's the thing though. It, it, if if Freddie hadn't made a huge number of changes this game, the media would do finger pointing, and be like, "Well, why didn't you make a huge number of changes?" Right? Mm-hmm. So. I think he's in a bit of a, a, a catch-22. The only way he can get out of this is if the squad wins. Yeah. And, and I think that's what he's looked at this as, uh, and he's said, okay, I just need to I need to win this game. I need to win win this game. 
right? I can't, we can't, even if they end up losing the series, right? People be like, okay, well, they, they lost in Brisbane. That was going to happen. But at least we won one game. Yeah. And there was a f- few mistakes in, in game one. And then game two was always going to be hard because it's in Brisbane. Fine, whatever. But if you go down 0-2 in the series with a game to play in Brisbane, that's that's horrific. That is very, very bad for New South Wales. If you, if you lose a series 0-3, that's really, really bad. Yeah. Right? So I think he's in a situation where he ha- he he's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't, unless he wins. But, so yeah. he has to win this game. It, it just... all that's all it predicates on. And so he looked at it, and he said, you know, the 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 Penrith Panthers last year, one of the best best squads I think you could say arguably in the history of the NRL. And he's reunited. That's one of the reasons <laughs> I think he's put Bert in there because he uh, he's that's seen an the outrageous statement you've just made. They, they, who they, they lose to they in the semis? They lost to the Rabbits huh? in the semis. Yeah. yeah. They had to play they Melbourne. The yeah, because remember they had to play Melbourne in the premier prelim finals. Oh. So I, I get what you're saying. Like this I don't is, think that's the I don't think that's the case. Last, I don't think that's last the case year. At all. Yes, they did. Because that's yeah, I got, I got the Rabbits. I got yeah, it was Wayne Bennett's master. No, they they plus. played they played the Rabbits in the semis, mate. I'm, yeah, I'm telling you. Might, you might, I'm 100 percent right. You might be right. This, they, they're a good they, they, squad. Then they played Parramatta. They're, yeah, that's right. They lost. They lost to South Sydney. Then they went and played Parramatta, right? But then they went and they played Melbourne and they yeah, beat Melbourne. Beat Melbourne and, then and they then beat played, the Rabbits. Played South Sydney. But look at you. Look at them in the regular season, right? <laughs> and they were they were fantastic. <laughs> Again, well. I'm, not, so I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I see what your point you're making. They're, they're but what your statement? Yeah, I had to. but I'm, the, the core of the, the core of the, the core of that team of what they of what they did last year, and they were ex- they were extraordinary last year. Right? Yeah. You look at them during the regular season last year, and they were extraordinary. Right, so you could say what you want to say about the, the finals and whatnot, but they ended up winning the premiership as well. Um, they they were they were ex- extraordinary, and I think reuniting that core. I get your concerns about cry, about uh, Burton in the centres, and I do look at both these centres, and I think these are attacking centres more so than defensive centres. Yep. Right, but that being said, I don't think Katoni Stags is that is a defensive centre. Hundred percent agree. I, agree. I, I yeah. think Stags is a boom or bust player and he was very flat in game one yep. he had a couple moments that were like okay but he didn't yeah i think he just needs a little bit more experience at the nrl level before he's ready for for the blues and i i think burton might be younger than him as well but burton i feel like is a little bit more mature um i don't know you just watch him play i think playing in the sixth jersey has given him an extra level of maturity because he knows he needs to command a game. Yeah. But I think he... Staggs is a great ball runner. He's great with the ball in his hands. But Burton can create outside of just running the ball and having great runs. He can create plays himself. He's not afraid to do like we saw Selvin Cobo do and put the uh, put boot to the ball and set up uh, other players. Whereas I think Staggs plays a lot for himself. And I think that's not... How you can, I don't you can win that way in Origin. You have to have the entire playbook open. I think Stags, as crazy as it's going to sound, he's he's a bit more one dimensional than what Burton is. I think Burton offers more. So I, would, I think I would Burton agree with has got statement. a higher ceiling, yeah. I guess, in terms of what he can provide from that centre position. I would agree with that statement outside of his individual play. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. But again, I'm I'm, I'm saying like you, you, we're all talking about this and. <laughs> From last year, and he's getting getting the band back together with Bird and being back there. But Bird has been playing for the Bulldogs at six all season. Like he, yeah. I, there's not one training he would have done at centre. He hasn't played the centre position this whole season. Now you can say, okay, Jack White, and yes, I get it totally. But I just go, this is the first game he's ever playing for New South Wales, and he's in the centre position where he hasn't trained at all season. Going up, if he's going up against Val Holmes as well, it's that's no easy task. Like. Like Val was at his best, so I just go. I'm interested. It's an interesting. One. I I love what you've done with Api Coruscant. I forgot to mention that. I think yeah. that and Cook on the bench, exactly what you said, 100 percent right. That's a link between the Panthers that you needed. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just <laughs> is it's going to be interesting. That's all I can say. Yeah, it is. It's going to be a great a counterpoint as well. I'm going to say though is that the first time the White and suited up in center for the Blues. How often do you think he trained at center before that? But but what happened in that series the first time White and he didn't he didn't play badly I don't, I don't I don't even know what the result was but I don't that he, series he was the series him well. and him and Guffo were at the centres when you lost no to no the... no he no White and played centre before that 
Whiten has played Whiten played in a, a, a well, few years. Well, okay, let's talk about that series then. When you played against the worst Queensland team ever and lost because your centres were. That's not the se- <laughs> yeah, that was that was a bad that was a bad series. Of course, it was. But he was in but the again, centers, I mean, like it's again, yeah. it's, this is Whiten's experience of New South Wales. Uh, we could go at this all day he's, because I just he's, Burton's first yeah, ever I, game in New South Wales is going to be a position he hasn't played in all year. That's what that's all I'm saying. But, like, okay, uh, yeah, I'm, and Whiten's first experience at, at centre for New South Wales was a position he hadn't played all year either. But he still didn't have a bad series, and it's not the series. It's not the series where they lost the worst team. I'm pretty sure it was the one where Trebovich scored three tries in Perth. I'm, like I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a series that Wyden played the other centre position as well, or it might have been uh, Freddie's first year of coaching the Blues. Like Whiten has has played, he, he played centre before. Before that, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't, I get the concern, hundred percent, hundred percent. It is a valid concern. I don't think it will be a, a, as big of an issue as sort of what you're you're making out to be, or what you think it potentially could be. Uh, yeah, again, and I, 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 do, I don't I don't even hope I don't hope it is. Like I, my my yeah. thing is I think it's going to be more a quiet. Like we're going to have a, just a quiet game from Burton again. It, there's <coughs> potential he goes boom. There's a potential he goes bust, and that's yeah. what we're we're talking about the extremities really because we're I'm talking about. Yeah him having a defensive misread that causes a try because he hasn't played at centre all series. You're talking about yep. him breaking down the line, putting on his left boot for Tedesco running through the middle to score a try. Like We're talking about boom or bust. Yep. I think it's probably going to be middle exactly. line, which is what you'd probably get from Katoni Staggs, who's had a game in there, who is also a likely like boom or bust type thing. But I'm thinking Katoni Staggs goes in there, he's played centre, he's had one game already, now in the, in the mm. fire. Again... Like you said, it's hard for a New South Wales coach. You, you, you're going to get fingers pointed at Yeah, Why didn't you make this decision? Why didn't you make that decision? That was just the one that took me. It, it just seemed like it's gone over every other media outlet's head, like Burton was the right choice. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm unsure. I am I, so unsure. I think as well, remember Staggs did hurt his shoulder in the, in the first game. I'm surprised he stood up for the Broncos this week. Uh, uh, if he even did, I didn't. I didn't see him in that game that much. But so I think Freddie's concerned a little bit about that shoulder. So yeah. I think that has played into it as but well. But even that, that um, that's, that's that's where I go, man. You've got to have him in the twenty-two squad. You've got to like at least like that's that, that that's that culture. I just it's just that that, that whole the rest of that twenty-two yeah. having bringing Victor Radley in when he's probably not going to play like. Unless you're doing something funky with changing him at the last minute, I don't see that happening because no, I don't know what he's, even. He's position. just there to to be. Yeah, he's just in there to be in the camp and around. But again, players. that's why I go. And Ado Car would, have, like you said, I know he can just come in and do the job, and you want to experience some guys. But Ado Car in the camp, I think, gives you that aura of confidence that yeah, fuck, we can do this. Like the Panthers I, boy. I, I, ag- I agree with that, and I would honestly have him in the camp. Uh, this over Clint Gutherson. Yeah. This this camp because. That not only for for the whole squad, but specifically for Burton as well, to be supportive 100%. of Burton, his teammate, yeah. and to be someone in the camp that he knows he's got some outside of the Panthers that he knows he's got some chemistry with as well. So, but I think yeah, Burton. I'm does glad we can agree. Got all these former teammates there, <laughs> we can yeah. agree that Ed Carr should be in the camp. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. I think he should. I think he should be in there over, over Gutherson. Yeah. I think McLean is lucky. To be there, I, I, I don't, don't know. I don't, what, I don't know what that is again. The Cowboys are going good, yeah. but RCG to me, yeah. There's, it's just, uh, it's going to be so interesting this game. Uh, yeah, it's going to uh, be I a great game. That, gonna... I think we can. I think that that's almost a, a certainty is that it's going to be um, a great game. And yeah, we look. I mean, I always predict a, a Blues win, but and arguably the Blues could have should have won that that first game uh, if Isaiah yeah, wasn't held on the ground for five seconds oh, and the referee God, didn't allow to play the ball with seconds left. But anyway, yeah, right. anyway, but anyway, <laughs> look, it was a great it was a great game, and I think yeah, the Maroons came out and played really really well. I think they'll do that the same thing here in Perth, but um, but Perth is has been good to the Blues before, so I think it'll be good again this year. We shall see, my friends. Alrighty, I think that is us for today. It's been <laughs> yep. a big one. Uh, obviously, yep. the the Super Rugby final and then yeah, State of Origin squads. There's a lot to discuss and to yes. dissect. Um, but yeah, it's it's been another good potty potty. Number twenty six. We are in fact in June. Yep. Um, but mm. Dragons aren't going to wear it when again to August. You heard it here for the second okay, time. Okay, sure. So I said, it, I said it the first time. I'm trying it again. <laughs> control C, okay, control so, okay, V. No, no, we gotta, control we gotta, C, we gotta, control We've got to do something here yeah. now because you, you can't get you can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> and just make his name on this. We're gonna have to do something. Okay, let's make let's make a little bet. Yep. What happens, right? 
if because I'm gonna because the first one I'm you've got that one right that's, that's free that you, was a freebie you, you, that was my freebie uh, <laughs> yeah so what happens now if the dragons do win again before august if the dragons win before august the podcast after i'll do it in a dragon's shirt and the dragon's jersey I like those terms. if the dragons don't win until august you've got to do the podcast first podcast in august in a titans shirt why why in a titans why do you like, why do you think <laughs> I they they the haven't titans. done anything. Yeah, no, but that's, yeah, they haven't done anything. That's the deal. Because I'm not just doing this. Isn't a half bet. This is a if it comes off, yeah, I deserve okay. something. So you've got to get it too. But again, okay. pending pending me being able to buy one on a, on a Saturday or Sunday. If they went on on like a Sunday yeah. and we do the podcast on Monday, <laughs> I may not be able to get my hand on yeah. it. But the next yeah. podcast we'll I have the opportunity, in. I will. Yeah, wear a Dragons okay, sure. Jersey. You you heard you heard it here first, folks. So if the at Dragons don't win again, in Jersey's going to be wearing right. a Titans jersey in August. That's what you heard. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not lashing out for a full jersey. I, wear, I get a cap. <laughs> I'll a cap, and then I'll donate it to Vinny's. Right? So, so the Dragons that week. So the Dragons play on the thir- Sunday, the thirty first of July. Right, so the very last day of July, <laughs> they've got into that, and that's against the Cowboys. Um, so they've got right up until then um, to to, to do it. So, um, yeah, Deal I mean, done. yeah, the, I mean, the Titan, Titans aren't work, winning against. We, the yeah, we, we don't need to. We, whoa, 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 we, I forgot we've mentioned their name too many times already on this yeah. podcast. Well, you Five brought it. You, br- you, yeah, you well, broke the seal. You, no, you broke no, the seal. I used to first. It had to be done. Had to be done. You could have said the team from Gold Coast. That's team what from Gold Coast. Okay, doing. well, that's what well, I'll, yeah. I'll get onto that. I'll train myself. I've just <laughs> said their name so yeah. often because obviously, as a supporter, you do that. But now that they've yeah. lost my trust. All righty. Thank yeah. you for joining us today. It's been a hell of a ride. We will see you again yes. next week uh, to recap all of State of Origin 2, especially. See ya. Yes. Peace.